I ask that you also remember Rhonda Eshman in your prayers. She'll be having surgery uh, tomorrow. We've been praying for her as she's been going through testing for thyroid cancer, and uh, the surgery is scheduled for tomorrow. So I know she'd appreciate your prayers that that surgery goes well. Well, last week was a bit of a heavy week. As I uh, read my, or tried to read, (laughs) my uh, announcement of retirement, and uh, though it's still two two weeks, two years off, (laughs) you're not getting rid of me that soon, two years away, Uh, as I mentioned last week, I want to uh, uh, preach a series of four sermons, including last week's sermon. Um, that I hope will help to prepare us for uh, the search process and the decisions that lie ahead of us, the changes that lie ahead. Um, Incidentally, I think there are copies of the letter, the retirement letter that I wrote, um, still available in the Narthex, and if you are interested, uh, you can pick one of those up after service. Um, Stand then, if you would. And uh, we're going to be going back to Ephesians chapter 2. And I want to read beginning in verse 19, just a few verses from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Paul says to Gentiles, he's speaking to Gentiles here, he says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And Paul has been saying earlier in the chapter that in Christ the barriers between Jews and Gentiles have been broken down, and in Christ Jews and Gentiles alike have been invited in to God's family, and so he calls them fellow citizens. You belong to God's people, God's holy nation, and you are members of God's household. Then in verse 20, which is where we'll begin in my sermon today, he says, that household is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You can be seated. Paul, I'm getting a bit of a ring up here. You might want to turn the intake down a little bit. So as we move into this uh, season of transition, as I said, we're going to be taking a break from Judges for a few weeks and prepare ourselves for that uh, coming transition in the fall of 2026 when I'll retire. And between now and then, we have some important decisions that we need to make. As I mentioned last week, those decisions involve change. And... uh, While change can be difficult, it also can provide us with an opportunity for growth. It can provide us with growth as we evaluate where we are. Before you go forward, it's good to kind of think about where are you, right? (laughs) Uh, Where do we go from here? So where is here? And that's what I want to talk about today. But it can grow us as we wrestle through tough decisions together and consider together the direction that God is leading us from here. And so today I want to spend some time as we kind of prepare our minds and our hearts for the things that lie ahead of us. I want to spend some time today reminding ourselves of some of the foundational truths from God's word that we need to hold firmly as we enter this season of change. Because the fact is that change comes to us all, but as we change, there are some things that should not change. 
And I want to talk about those things today. I want to review as well um, some of the values and the commitments that have shaped us, Troy Christian Chapel, as a congregation over the last number of years, so that as we look into the future and uh, the opportunities that lie ahead of us, we do so with a clear sense of what has been important to us in the past and what has shaped us and made us what we are today. And that's really an important exercise. Because as I said, we need to have a clear sense of who we are and what's important to us before we can really adequately address the question, who do we want to be and where are we going? So I want to start by looking at this short passage from Paul's letter to the Ephesians where he talks about the church. And especially I want to draw your attention to the metaphor of a building that Paul uses to help us understand what the church is. And as he talks about this metaphor of a building, he's not talking about a building like this, that we are in the process of remodeling a building made of wood and stone. But rather what Paul says is that we are that building. So he says in verses 21 and 22, he says, In Christ, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And then he says, In him you also, that is, you and I also, are being built together into a dwelling place where God lives by his Spirit. If you think about it, what Paul says there marks a radical shift in the way that God relates to people. Throughout the Old Testament, and including the time of Jesus, God was understood to dwell in the temple in Jerusalem behind the thick curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And so the perception was that even though God is in our midst, in the temple, there is a barrier between him and us. But now, Paul says, God has chosen to dwell in a different kind of temple because because of the work of Christ, that curtain, that barrier has been taken away. And now God has chosen to dwell in a temple that is not made by human hands, but rather to dwell in the hearts of his people by placing his Holy Spirit in each one of us. And his purpose, if you look at what Paul is saying here, his purpose is not only to dwell in us individually, but also to knit us together as his people into a single entity, his church, in which he makes his dwelling place. We are the temple. I love the way that Peter puts it in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. He says, you, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. How do you like that? You're a stone. You are living stones. And that is fundamentally what we are as a congregation. The church is not this building. The church is not a group of people who have certain things in common. The church is not an organization or a club. It is an organism a living temple built out of living stones. 
And we here at Troy Christian Chapel are a local expression of that living temple. But that living temple is comprised of believers from around the world, and it stretches across cultures and ethnic groups. It transcends denominational differences and political differences and racial differences. And we have a tendency sometimes as to, to get myopic in the way we think about these things and to think we are the church. <laughs> And that's why we pray for a different congregation every week to remind us that the church is bigger than us. And that is a wonderfully good thing, is it not? Not only does it stretch around the world, but it also stretches across time, reaching back into history to encompass the saints of centuries past and reaching forward in time to embrace those that have not yet been born. And along with them, we here at TCC are being built together as living stones into a living temple in which God himself dwells. That's a mind-blowing thought, isn't it? I'll talk more about the implications of that for us next week. But the point I want to make from that today is this. This is God's church. It's not our church. This is God's church. So as we make decisions about our future, as we must do, It is essential that we not think in terms of shaping TCC into the church that we want it to be. Rather, it is essential that we commit ourselves as a congregation to be what God would have us be. The fact is that what we want and what God wants aren't always the same thing. Have you noticed that? And that's important to remember because it's easy to fall into a consumer mentality when it comes to the church and to think of it in terms of whether it suits our tastes or meets our expectations in the same way uh, kind of that we might look for a good burger joint. And by the same token, as the church, it's tempting to drift in the minds, into the mindset of trying to attract people and make sure that we do things so that people like what we're doing and that we fit in and, 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 uh, and, and they, they are attracted to us. But in the end, they ought to be attracted to us. But it ought to be not because we're bending over backward to fit, to, to, to fit their expectations, but because they see God here. They see Christ in us. So we may do this or that to make ourselves more appealing to the culture around us. But the real question is not, does this or that church have what we're looking for? And the question is are not, are we giving people what they want? The real question is, does this congregation exalt God and bring honor to him? Are the people here growing up together in Christ? Is his word being preached? Is the gospel going forth among us and from us? Those are the questions that we need to keep in the forefront of our minds as we consider where we're going from here and what we want to be as we go into the future. So as Paul and Peter both tell us, the church is a living temple. 
built out of living stones in whom God dwells through his spirit, being built together into a holy dwelling place for God. And then in verse 20, he also tells us about the foundation that that living temple is built on. I know a little bit about building, and uh, every building has to have a solid foundation. If the foundation isn't firm, then the entire structure will be weakened and compromised. Have you ever gone down the highway and you see... Uh, barns that are kind of going like this. <laughs> I've, I've been in some houses. We, we rented a, a, a place, a beach house a few years ago that actually kind of made you a little dizzy to walk in it because the floors were so far out of level. <clears throat> Paul says this living temple, the church, is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Nowadays, when we build a foundation, we pour a concrete footing in the ground, and then we build the foundation on top of that. But in the ancient world, foundations were built by stacking massive stones in an interlocking pattern to create the base on which the structure could be built. And the most important stone was the cornerstone. The cornerstone was a massive stone. In fact, <clears throat> some of the temple, the, the, the stones of the temple, I mentioned this a number of weeks ago, have been, um, have been um, uncovered, and they are massive stones. They're bigger than a semi-truck. They're just huge, and you got to wonder, how'd they get them there? But the placement of those stones was so essential, especially the cornerstone, because it served as the junction point for the walls of the foundation. And it had to be secure enough to carry the weight of those walls, and it had to be precisely placed so that the lines that came off the edges of the cornerstone would Put the building where you wanted it to go. And if it was off in any way, if there was even the slightest imperfection in the cornerstone, it would actually just get magnified in the entire structure. So everything else depended on the cornerstone. And that is the picture that Paul gives us here. Christ is the cornerstone of the church. Everything we are depends on him. It is he who gave his life on the cross in order that we might be reconciled to God. And apart from him and what he has done for us, there would be no church. And his life and teaching serve as the rock on which the rest of the foundation and the entire structure of the church is built. And on that cornerstone, Paul says, is built the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the picture that Paul wants us to have in our minds is of two foundation walls that come together and meet and interlock over that cornerstone. And that corner that is formed by the interlocking walls gives both walls and the building that rests on them their strength. And what there's some question in terms of who does Paul mean when he talks about the prophets? Is he talking about New Testament prophets or Old Testament prophets? Um, I'm going to tell you the answer. <laughs> it seems to me that what Paul is referring to here is both the New Testament apostles and the Old Testament prophets. So the apostles form one wall, as it were. 
and the teachings of the Old Testament prophets form the other wall. And both of these come together in Christ. The Old Testament prophets pointed forward to Christ. And the New Testament apostles point back to Christ. And together they are joined in Christ and bring into focus that the church is about Christ. It is from Christ and it depends on Christ and it is for Christ. And together, the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles form God's word, which is the foundation of the church because it's the authority on which our faith rests. And again, these are vital truths for us to remember as we enter this season of transition and change. While there are some things in our life as a congregation which can change and even must change, this foundation on which we are built must not change. It cannot change. The person and work of Christ and the witness of the apostles and prophets must remain at the center of how we see ourselves and what we teach and what we do. This is the firm foundation on which we must build, and this is the only foundation on which we ought to build as God's people. Just as a foundation defines the building that is built upon it, this foundation of Christ and the word of God defines who and what we are as a congregation. It defines what we should consider to be important. It defines the values that we should have as a congregation. It defines what we ought to be teaching. It defines our ministry our ministry both within these walls as well as our ministry outside of these walls in the community around us. And it defines not only who we are today, but what we ought to be as we go into the future and the decisions and the changes that lie on the horizon. One of the awesome things about the church, if you think about that big, whole church, one of the awesome things about it is the tremendous variety and diversity that it contains. The book of Revelation celebrates that in Revelation chapter 7, where John has this vision of a, a multitude beyond Counting, gathered around the throne of God from every nation and tongue and language. That diversity is a good thing. God intends it to be diverse. And so while each local congregation builds on the same foundation, each congregation is also a unique expression of that living temple that is built upon it. Each church has its own unique personality. Have you noticed that as you go from church to church? And that uniqueness is a good thing if it is built on the foundation, on the right foundation. Each church has its own unique personality based on the values that they hold and based on the living stones out of which that congregation is built. And TCC is no exception. As a congregation, we have sought to build our life together on that one foundation, 
and the commitments that we've made and the values that we uphold as important have shaped who we are today as a unique expression of God's church here in this place in Troy. And as we go forward, it's important that we remind ourselves of those things and remember why those things are important. Toward that end, I encourage you to, as we kind of, in preparation for the decisions that lie ahead of us, I encourage you to get a copy of our bylaws. They are interesting reading. But refresh your memory of how we are structured as a local congregation. Decisions that we collectively as a body have made in the past that will help us and guide us as we go into the future. And as you do that, pay special attention to our statement of faith. Because our statement of faith contains those truths that we believe are essential to all Christians everywhere. They essentially um, lay down that firm foundation that we have received from the apostles and the prophets. And as you read our statement of faith, I encourage you to take note not only of what it says, but also of what it doesn't say. And you'll notice that our statement of faith doesn't take a stand on a lot of the theological issues and disagreements that often divide churches from each other. And that is intentional because we want to be clear about what the main things are. Sometimes people say, you know, you guys don't take a stand on this or that, and, and, it, it, it's, and, and it's like the implication is that we're kind of wishy-washy. But the fact that we don't take a stand on issues that divide Christians means that we want to take our stand in the place that we ought to take our stand and not to be wishy-washy about that. We want to be clear about what the main things are and give room for people who have different points of view regarding the secondary issues that too often divide us. And there are two reasons. First of all, we don't want to place doctrine above Christ, but always keep him front and center. doesn't mean that doctrine isn't important or that it's not important to to be precise in our understanding of the word of God. But in all of that, that Christ always has to be front and center. And we also want to take seriously what scripture teaches, that it's Christ that makes us one. It's not our music and that we all agree we love our music That's one of the reasons why our music changes from week to week, because we recognize that as one, we want to serve everybody that has different tastes in that way. It's not our theology on all the finer points about what you believe about the tribulation or all kinds of other issues that make us one. Christ makes us one. And though Christians may have all kinds of different ideas about a lot of different things, in the end, what we hold as most important, what we hold in common, is Christ. And that is greater than all of our differences. I also want to draw your attention as we close to the bulletin insert that I've given you, this uh, purple sheet in your bulletin. <clears throat> what, we, what I've given you there are 
the values and commitments that have guided us in our congregational life throughout my time as your senior pastor. If you were there back in October of 2014 for the town hall meeting that we had as part of my, uh, my candidacy to become your pastor, um, I gave you this um, document or presented it to you and actually gave it to you, I think, in printed form as well. But what's contained here are not my values. Rather, they reflect many of the commitments that have shaped TCC through the decades into the congregation that it is today. And one of the reasons that I came here 40 years ago is that I recognized that TCC was shaped by those values and I resonated with them. And so when I became your senior pastor, it became my commitment to continue to affirm and to um, support those values that have shaped us in the past. And I believe these values that are listed here also reflect a biblical view of what the church should be as we strive to conform ourselves as a congregation to God's will for us as a living temple in which he dwells. So I want to just briefly go through them. First, the first page there lists our foundational values, which are to know Christ, to grow in the stature of Christ, and to magnify Christ. Christ needs to be at the center. And so in order for that, we to know Christ, that involves knowing God's word. We can't know Christ without knowing God's word because if we don't root our knowledge of Christ in his word, then we're just using our own imagination. But it involves more than just head knowledge of what the Bible says. It also involves a personal relationship with Christ and our individual commitment to follow him in a life of discipleship. We want to grow in the stature of Christ so that as we are growing and becoming obedient and conforming our lives to what his word says, we are becoming like him. That's the point of obedience. God calls us to obedience, not because he likes to control us, but because he wants us to live in the freedom of a life that is conformed to his likeness. He made us to be in his image. And it is as we grow in obedience to him that we grow in his image. But that also involves our corporate growth as a body, as Paul talks about later in his letter to the Ephesians, that as we speak the truth in love to each other, we will on, in all things grow up together in Christ who is our head. And so we're committed to growing as individuals, but we're also committed to each other as a body, to growing together and recognizing that by our life together, we are helping each other to grow. And we're committed to magnifying Christ, delighting in his goodness, glorifying him in our individual lives. That means making it visible so that he can be seen in us, reflecting him in our relationships with each other in our life as a congregation, and then declaring the gospel of Christ out in the world. Then if you turn that page over, it starts by saying TCC is a scripturally rooted, Christ-centered congregation that is committed to first sound, biblically driven teaching and preaching. That is so essential. I have that commitment to you that it's God's word that we be feeding on from week to week 
And there may be times where you say, well, how is this relevant to me? (laughs) But as we take it in, we discover more and more just how relevant it is. We're committed to personal and corporate prayer because God calls us into a relationship with him, both as individuals and as a congregation. We're committed to personal discipleship, as I mentioned a few moments ago, as foundational to our spiritual life. We're committed to a strong sense of our shared life as a community of believers. And I'll talk more about that this week. If you were in our John class for Sunday school this morning, we talked about that. That it is, that is at the heart of what Jesus asked the Father on our behalf, that we would be one. And so this shared life that we have as a community of believers is is not something that is tangential to our faith, but it's essential that we commit ourselves to it. We're committed to interdenominational openness, and I think it is such a blessing that I get to gather with people every week who come from all kinds of different backgrounds. I come from a Baptist background, and we have Methodists here, and Catholics, former Catholics here, and we have former Presbyterians, and Wesleyans, and and Nazarene, and all kinds of different groups that are represented by us here, and many of us still value the traditions that we came from, and we ought to. And yet we are gathered here together as one congregation for that same reason, because we recognize that Christ is bigger than our traditions. We're committed to upholding the invaluable contribution of historic Christianity to our present life. As Americans, we struggle with that. I was thinking about that I was right, as I was writing this sermon and just thinking about our tendency as Americans because we don't have deep roots to just, when we want change, we just wipe the slate clean and we start over again and we forget about what was before, right? Um, I think about Tiger Stadium <clears throat> and that was, what, a little over 100 years that it lasted. And then the Silver Dome was, I don't know, maybe 55 years or something. How long did the Palace of Auburn Hills last before we said, we don't need it anymore? 20, 20 years. So it's important for us to sink our roots into the past, into the insights and the spiritual wisdom that those who have come before us from a whole range of Christian traditions can offer us and provide us to help us in our own journey. Paul, uh, the writer to the Hebrews talks about that in, in Hebrews chapter 12, right? When he talks about this great cloud of witnesses that testify to us of the faithfulness of God. And that is what we have That is the resource that's available to us from historic Christianity. We're committed to unity amidst diversity in our congregational life. We are not the church of everybody being the same. We want to understand what true diversity in Christ looks like. Diversity that has as its boundaries biblical authority, and yet at the same time does not demand uniformity to fit in. We're committed to equipping and supporting lay people for ministry. I talked about that last week. You are the ministers. My role and Pastor Brian's role is to equip you for that ministry. We're committed to a strong intergenerational ministry that recognizes that every member of this body, whether they be very young or very old, has a place and we all belong together in this ministry, in this congregation. 
We're committed to cultural and ethnic diversity and racial diversity and recognizing that Christ has torn down the boundaries that often exist between us in those ways. And we're committed to, as individuals and as a congregation, declaring the gospel to the lost. Those are the values and commitments that have shaped who we are as a congregation, and they have contributed to the unique expression of the body of Christ here at TCC. And and I have to tell you, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to me. And as we go forward, it doesn't mean it's not without its blemishes, right? We have our we have our our flaws, we have our problems, but it's beautiful. And as we go forward, I encourage you that these values need to serve as touchstones for us to help us set our point of sale so that in this season of change, as we consider what's next for us, we don't lose sight of who we are or the values that have shaped us to this point. And so that as we change, we will remain true to what God intends his church to be. Because after all, it is his church. Amen? Amen. Guys, come on back up. You're going to lead us in a closing song. As they come, let me uh, lead you in a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for this foundation that you have given to us, both in terms of uh, uh, the, the temple that you are building us into and the foundation that has been laid for it in Christ and in the teaching of the prophets and the apostles and in the heritage that we have as a congregation that stretches back decades and values and commitments that we have sought to uphold that have shaped who we are today. We pray, Father, your blessing upon us as we move forward As we go forward and make decisions uh, that lie ahead of us, we want to bring honor to you. We want to remain true to what you have called the church to be. And we want to continue to grow in the values and commitments that we have, that you would be glorified in this place. Thank you that we can trust you to do that as we seek you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace to you, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's been good to be gathered together as God's people today. May Christ continue to be our vision as we go forth from here. God bless you as you go.